yeah. Shall we? Uh, cheers. Toast, toast. Cheers. Uh, in Vietnamese, it's, it's Mot Hai Bai Yo, which yeah. is one, two, three, in. Yeah. So we'll do that. Mo hai ba yo, right? Yo, okay, ready? Time, ready? One, One, two, two three. three. Mo hai ba yo. Cheers, brother. Mmm. Mmm. This is that Vietnamese iced coffee, aka crack. <laughs> Good morning, Vietnam. We are here in Nha Chang at the Sheraton, and we got a special guest all the way from the states. This is first time here in Vietnam, and it's our first as well. Yes, What's our first up? podcast. Yeah. You're breaking the chair. You're popping the chair with us right now. Thanks. Yeah, buddy. So we got Mr. Joe Jitsukawa. Yes. Hello. It wasn't always Joe. I think it was a Joe Jovados. Joe Joe. Joe Joe. Uh, Uncle Chin. Yeah. Um, uh, that the homeless guy. <laughs> like all these characters. Uh, I think you started YouTube uh, back in the golden ages, which was I'm very honored to be a part of. Yeah. So well, how long? Wait, you guys known each other for more than ten years, right? Yeah. And yeah. how did that all start? We met probably 2008. Um, yeah, so when I first started YouTube in 07, me and my business partner, Bart Kwan, uh, we basically made skits without knowing that they were skits. We would just fuck around and we would make funny videos on YouTube and we would use YouTube as a way like how people use Vimeo now. Yeah. You just upload videos and you would send it around. And um, you know, like people just started watching it and because we would just link it to our friends and they would link it to other people. And one time we got a hundred views and we we're like, oh my God, dude, we were viral. <laughs> yeah, That's a hundred yeah, yeah, yeah. views. So um, I forgot how I met Danny, but I just know Danny contacted us and he was like, I want to film for you guys. Because back then we were just using a laptop uh -huh. and we were just editing and doing our own thing. And Danny was like, I think it'll be better if you have somebody hold the camera and edit for you. Oh, so you guys were like, you guys were literally acting and videoing yeah. at the same time. Just you yeah. two, you and your yeah. business partner. Yep. Oh, so in came Danny and helped kind of like create kind of like the more uh, um, for me I, I found it on MySpace you know mm. actually they were posting those MySpace. videos on MySpace and I first saw uh, Bart uh, on MySpace first as Uncle Sam mm -hmm. uh, Uncle Sam gets jacked by the, oh shout outs to Bart Kwan we miss you hope you were here but uh, anyways we I saw that on MySpace and I said dude this there has to be more content like this. I've yeah. never seen anything like this. Yeah. So we went on. Uh, I went on YouTube and I looked, and there was a uh, suggested video, which was Joe. Okay. And I, I was so excited because it was a, a character that was doing his chin backwards. I think it a con it was a concept of Uncle Chin. Yeah, yeah. And that's how I came up with the name Uncle Chin because wow. it was a chin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but it was so funny, and I went, dude, like it, th these guys are great. I want to see more content like this, and I realized. They were together. Yeah, we were mm. friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you didn't know that we were. Oh, yeah, yeah. And when I and then finally the 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 one video that made me go, I gotta contact these guys, was the everyday go to school song. Oh right. So yeah. we made a music video, and I produced a beat with my buddy, and yeah, it was just it was just random. And I think at the time people didn't know that we were fucking around. They were yeah. not because we, we it was like Borat, you know, yeah, it was yeah, like yeah, yeah. character work. So people were like not sure if we were real or not. And that, that added a lot to the magic. But yeah. yeah, at that time, I think when we met Danny, uh, Danny really helped us get to a different quality because he has his film background, he has his editing skills. Brought a little bit more of the technical side to it, right? Yeah, it gave us the freedom to meet, uh, to act mm -hmm. and, and write story while mm -hmm. someone else took care of the technical part. Mm -hmm. and, and, like, and at the same time, he would teach us all this film stuff. Like, you know, what is an over-the-shoulder shot and all this stuff and, like, editing techniques. And then so um, he really helped us in the growth of our company. Yeah. So back then when he came along, it was all love, you know? Yeah, I mean, personally for me, it was I, it was no agenda. I just, I just want to work with these guys. Yeah. yeah. But the one thing that really made it special because uh, I reached out. I didn't know they were from L.A. Uh, so I was like, um, are you... So how did you message them? I know that back in the day they had like direct message, so I don't know, how did you reach out to I, them? I believe it was MySpace too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I reached out and I think MySpace. Bart responded. Yeah. Mm. Bart responded and said, we can meet, take a meeting with you. So it's dead serious. Like, oh shit, these guys are real. Where are you guys from? Los Angeles. I'm in Orange County. Can you somehow come down? At the time, I was the, the, the chief editor at Saigon TV. Mm. I was fairly young. I was probably like 25, 24. Okay. But we were actually, I had an office, everything. So everything yeah. was super legit. I said, won't nice. you guys come down? And the next day, they came down. Yeah. And, you know, like, I've never had that type of experience either. Yeah. So immediately. So just came together organically, which is dope, right? Yeah. Joe's there, Bart's there, and I'm like, these guys I saw on YouTube. And I'm sure you guys get that a lot now from your fans. But for me, I was a fan as well. I was like, wow, 
You guys are real. Like, I was just yeah. watching you on the screen. Now you're sitting right in front of me, right here, right? Yeah, but but I, honestly, at that moment, I was like, okay, let's do some work. Mm -hmm. I got a studio. I got all these cameras. Let's see where it worked out. And uh, rightfully so, we did three years. It was fun. Uh, we did a bunch of skits. And uh, I had an opportunity to do other things, so I decided to uh, take off. But, you know... Mm -hmm. He abandoned us to no, make uh, Vietnam uh, films. <laughs> no, but it was awesome though because yeah. at the time there wasn't much opportunity for Asian American filmmakers. Yeah, this was freaking 2010. Yeah, you know, uh, and um, ago. and Danny had this freaking awesome opportunity to make films in Vietnam, and yeah. we're like, "Yo, you got to do what you got to do, man." Mm -hmm. And for us, I think we weren't in that stage yet because Danny, you know, he's older and he's got more experience than us. So he was at that ripe stage of like, I'm ready to like produce and direct and do all this stuff. Right. So he had this opportunity. So he went off to do that. And for us, we were still learning how to build a business, build mm -hmm. a team, build, you know, like take it seriously because we, we really didn't start making any serious cash until we were like 28 Twenty nine. So how many old. how many years into the game were you there by that time? Oh, uh, shit, dude. Uh, so we it was five or six years into mm. the game. Ah. Yeah, and 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 to give you some perspective, right? Like yeah. we were paying ourselves like a thousand bucks a month, just yeah. building our. We paid our staff more than we paid ourselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, long story short, we realized. This is not sustainable because we were such an artist. We were just yeah. like, hey, man, as long as I get to do shows, I get to do what I love and yeah. I'm paying like the bills, like I'm renting a room out. I'm all good. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, we realized, wait a minute, if we want to build families and make money, I mean, we have to make money if we want to build families, raise kids and all that. And, um, you know, we got into some lawsuit troubles with a, with a former employee and all this stuff. So that re really was like, we got to take this shit serious. serious yeah. And that's when, like, in a matter of a couple of years, we, 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 uh, we turned into a two million dollar a year revenue from like making just a hundred couple hundred thousand. Mm. Yeah, we really pushed it hard. But that's what changed a lot of things for us. It, it helped us grow. It, it helped us learn. And I think like if Danny didn't leave. We wouldn't have got to that point of like having to learn how to fill that position, mm. right. and then because Danny left, we 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 met our director now, mm -hmm. um, who's been with us for like, for pretty much like seven years or yeah, something. The rest yeah, of like, the wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember uh, it was just one of those things I didn't want to ban you guys. It was one of the things that I felt who can take <laughs> over. Yeah, you yeah. know, and I was really adamant on making sure someone took over. And when you guys mm -hmm. introduced Casey, I was like, dude, perfect. Because yeah. why he was doing videos with other, uh, I think a guy named Wax. Yeah. So those those videos were were very creative and looked like they had budgets. And I said, yeah. dude, if anybody was gonna take over, it has to be this guy. Yeah, yeah. So I was very happy that it's still there and it's still growing. Yeah. But you know, I think everything happens for a reason. Obviously, we're yeah. in Vietnam right now. Yep. We're talking about the growth of Vietnam. We're talking about all this exciting experiences that uh, Vietnam has to offer. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact is, you're here. I've been waiting for this for a long time. Yeah, he's been many been years me. in the making. Many years in the as making. As soon as right? he started coming out here more often and then just living here, he was like, "You gotta come. Vietnam's on the rise." And I was like, "Um, yeah, I guess I would." But then it never really made me go like, "Hell yeah!" Until mm -hmm. yeah. this year when mm -hmm. he invited me again, he was like, yeah. "You gotta come to Vietnam." Maybe because it's not marketed where people like dream about it. You yeah. know, like it's not a tourist destination. It's just this year, my mom came and then like a bunch of my friends, you know, you know, they came to like right here in Nha Trang and the beach resorts and whatever. That's when I started thinking, oh, Vietnam looks kind of cool. Yeah. And then when he told me like a month ago, yo, you got to come. I was like, I'm ready. Let's go. Yeah. I, I mean, was surprised. I think, yeah. I think in general, Vietnam is just not at the, the, the first destination you think about when you think of Southeast Asia, right? Everyone thinks about Thailand, thinking about going to Bali and these other, like Singapore and places like that. So yeah. I'm super hyped just to see like the growth in the past few years and seeing Vietnam really become like this, like, um, you know, destination that a lot of people want to go to because it still has this like old school charm about it, right? Mm -hmm. Where like a lot of these other cities and stuff, they're becoming these concrete jungles. But Vietnam, it like, it feels like you're like, oh shit, this is something different, you yeah. know? Especially coming into the beach here, you know? It is a rainy day, but, uh, you know, usually the water is a lot more clear than this, but, uh, 
You know, Actually, it's a beautiful. It was, not, it was okay today. We went out yeah. to the beach and we had a little sun. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was, it was pretty yeah, good. We went to the water. Like tan. Yeah. So what was it? What was your first impression? Like you know, landing here at the the busy airport in uh, Ho Chi Minh City and stuff. So, well, I've been to other uh, Southeast Asian countries like okay. Malaysia and Thailand and all mm-hmm. that stuff, and I travel a lot. So, um, I for me, whenever I travel, it blows my mind to see how people have influence all over the world and then mm-hmm. they bring it together, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. like the first thing, you know, that I think most humans do is they make like relatable connections. Yeah. So when I came yeah. in, I was like, okay, this reminds me of Malaysia, Taiwan, Thailand, and France all put mm-hmm. into one. Yeah. The, and then there's just so many um, different Asian influences just all together, but there's a unique Vietnamese-ness to it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's it's just kind of crazy just seeing all of that put together. Yeah, I think the little history of Vietnam, obviously the French colonized Vietnam, and a lot of the structure in Ho Chi Minh City now yeah. is still very French. What else do you see in Vietnam that is, like, tripping you out? Mopeds? The traffic, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I've seen, you know, wild traffic all over Asia. I think this is probably the scariest. Uh, uh, because they drive so close to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah. I mean, I've been to Thailand, and then like even in Korea too. There's a lot of like scootering and all mm-hmm. that. But um, here, it's like everyone's just fearlessly walking through in and out of traffic, and everyone's so close. I always describe it as like organized chaos, and like yeah. people just kind of like they need to be able to anticipate your movement. Yeah. So as you're crossing the street, no like sudden like stop and stop and go. Like you need to just walk, and they will just like find their way to go around you. That's what I noticed. So like the first day, I was scared shitless, kind of like hiding by Danny. Yeah. yeah and yeah, then yeah. later, I was like, oh, you just gotta take it slow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you take it slow, everyone else is kind of moving slow. Yeah. So it's it's like yeah you walk through slow motion if you suddenly just run through i think nah, it's worse it's worse way yeah. worse i mean i've seen it's i, I laugh when i watch the tourists cross the street because some are like just stop some are running and then dr- they're like scaring the the motorbike yeah. drivers because like they can't anticipate where they're going or you know, i know what's gonna i happen. guess i guess on the other side of the spectrum when you're riding a motorbike the key is to drive faster than everybody else <laughs> i know it sounds crazy but you do you just gotta go but, fast and dodge people but you know honestly it works like surprisingly i don't see that many accidents you mm-hmm. know what i mean and it's like i said it's organized chaos and it just kind of just works you know i also I mean? think that like i'm used to cars stopping for me oh, so yeah. just my brain is like oh he's gonna stop and it doesn't and i'm uh, like oh shit yeah there's no uh, what is it uh, right right right, right, right away well the right of way is the biggest vehicle right yeah. that's usually yeah. the way it is in asia and i yeah. think that makes more sense because they have way more blind spots yep so people should watch out for the biggest vehicle. Dude, Vietnamese people are like the most resourceful people I've ever met. I mean, and they just make things out of nothing. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. there's times where like we needed rope, and then like, you know, one of our friends, Vietnamese friends, like he comes and he like grabs like this like yellow, you know, things that used to hold the cardboard boxes together. Mm-hmm. He like peels it in half, he ties it together, and then boom, all of a sudden you have string. <laughs> <laughs> it's like some MacGyver shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like that because they they're forced to be so resourceful because yeah. you know they're just, you know, so sometimes like you know being. Being American, I'm like, oh, I need to buy this and this. And they're like, wait, why don't you just turn that into this? I'm like, wait, what? How'd you think of that? So it just shows like kind of like the difference in, in, in culture and stuff. But I've been watching this um, YouTuber by like the name of Primitive Technology, right? Mm. And what he does is like from scratch, yeah. like he just uses like the, around yeah, you. stone, wood, all that. And then there's like a, like a, I don't know if they're Vietnamese, but there's like a Southeast Asian crew that does the same thing. Mm. And I started watching what they do. And they'll just make like huts and like all this stuff out of scratch. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, is it that people that are closer to nature and like they live in a village out there, like they're so used to just, you know, like, for example, like if you go get food out here, things are wrapped in banana leaves. You don't mm-hmm. really need plastic or whatever, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and then they, they use all these tools like just from nature. So mm-hmm. I'm like, maybe they see the world differently from us because they see everything as like, oh, that can be a tool, that can be a tool. I mean, it's, it's, it's efficient, no? Like they're reusing things, right? Instead of wasting it. Like for me, sometimes like I see something and like, you know, I want to throw it away. And then like my dad will come like, no, dude, I can reuse this for something else. Wow. You know what I mean? So it's just kind of like a different mindset. I think for Asian culture, especially here in Vietnam, what I've, what I've seen is people are just making the most use of everything. Like there's nothing like being put to waste. Mm-hmm. and. I think you know sometimes back home like we can kind of become a bit wasteful I guess how did I grow from 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 these indifferences that we all have 
Well, I like to study history and like like society's changing and all yeah. that stuff too. So I'm not like maybe the average person because I'm very observant of that stuff because I love watching people and culture a mm -hmm. lot, right? Yeah. And then like I also ask um, my family a lot of this stuff. So like a little bit of background is um, I'm Japanese American and, and most of my family is from Japan, right? Mm -hmm. So my grandma would tell me all these stories of when she was a kid and, and how Japan, you know, Japan and Korea, those are two countries that became a world economy like within a decade, like yeah. really fast. So so I kind of, it's almost like I'm watching that happen here, right? Like mm -hmm. it's like, it's almost like a farmer community that yeah. all of a sudden, boom. Whereas like, I think Japan was more of a, um, like, like Game of Thrones. You know what I mean? Like right, it's right. more like, it's more, it's it, they had their own system. Mm -hmm. Um, feudalism and then all of a sudden technology comes in and within like 10 20 years everything changes. they're a world power right yeah, yeah. so being able to witness vietnam like skyrocket from like all right these guys are just like living in huts mm -hmm. and then now they're just like using smartphones and all yeah. that yeah. that that to me is like oh my god this is crazy and then in the city you see these high rises and then like a mile away, there's like still shacks and huts. Yeah, yeah. And, and people are living that old way. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that that to me is like wow, that's pretty fascinating. And it's super smart because a lot of these people know that the value of where they're at will come. The, oh, the you investments mean like, will you come. Mean the uh, people you talk about that, the property. Yeah, that, that yeah, live right. on the property. Right. Yeah. The property is actually right now. Uh, the, there's an increase in sales in terms of wanting to get land in Vietnam. Yeah. So a lot of the locals that bought their land 10, 20 years uh, uh, before us. They know this, yeah. and they have, they're standing their ground and they're not selling their house. I mean, you think about all the people, the wealthiest people who are in, like, for example, Manhattan. If you own any property in Manhattan, I mean, it's like crazy amounts of money, right? Exactly. So if you could go back in time to like the early 1900s and buy yeah. something, I'm sure you would. So I feel like that's what's happening here in yeah. Vietnam mm -hmm. yeah. specifically. So like, it's exciting and it's, it's mind-blowing to see how much how quickly some of these like properties are going up in value. Yeah. So I have like a fun story. I think I was, I was telling you guys last night. It's like I took out a, a group of like uh, Vietnamese people when I, they went to um, Los Angeles. So we went around Beverly Hills, and that you know that's the most expensive zip code in the world, or the most well known zip code, right? Nine hundred two one zero. So I'm on that Zillow app where you can look at properties and compare what the pricing is. So they're looking at this like whole estate, and it's like a a huge property. It's like a huge house with like a huge front yard, backyard. So it's an estate. It's a huge piece of land and it's like seven million dollars or something like that and yeah like, oh that's it and i was like what do you mean that's it and they're like you know in vietnam like you know there's places in hanoi like on these main streets where you're looking at just like you know just a, a front right on the main street and it's maybe just like i don't know what is this like like 10 meters or something like that mm. like 10 meters like 30 something feet wide right how much and uh and it's a few million dollars like four or five million dollars oh, wow. so and that's I just see. like that building so yeah. it's like it's just the building here there's no front yard there's no backyard so it's more like new york or san francisco to exactly that. yeah yeah so then when they see they're in beverly hills they're like dude that's only that's seven million but they're like that's it i didn't understand it at the time and people i think they just don't well at least for me like when i think of vietnam i don't think real estate is expensive like that yeah when i think of vietnam i think Oh man, it's probably really cheap and yeah. affordable to to buy the stuff there. Yeah. I mean, there are places that are super cheap, but like the places kind of like in Hanoi, in the heart of the city. You know what I mean? Like that's basically the Manhattan or whatever, right? Yeah. Where there's just property is just more expensive than it is in the states. Well, I have an investor guy uh -huh. that is uh, Korean, a little over his fifties, mm -hmm. and I asked him, "Why are you in Vietnam investing in property?" And he goes, "You know what? It reminds me when I was twenty five. 25 mm. this was happening in Korea yeah yeah yeah. I mean that's, yeah, that, that's why it's, it's an exciting time to be here because like you know every time I go back to the States it's like I'm going into the future which is weird because yeah. I live in this like you know small <laughs> like true. like like beach town you know what I mean there's no Tesla's yeah first time I saw a Tesla I was tripping I was like whoa and that and, you know that's just driving itself yeah you know what I mean so it's exciting to go back see kind of like the different trends that are happening like um, in the US and like you know these more affluent cities and stuff and then see how we can kind of bring those different concepts back here Mm -hmm. And kind of like you know gr you know fine tune it a bit so it fits the culture. So that's one of the the exciting things for me, especially doing F and B and stuff and going and checking all these different restaurants yeah. or ho hotels and things like that. So, well, I mean, you 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 built out a club here, right? Yeah. So, what was that experience like as far as like 
doing something different that no one has really done before and like finding the contractors and mm-hmm. the and, and people to know what you're trying to execute. Ah, oh, dude. I mean, in the beginning, it was it was tough because people didn't understand our vision because they only know what they've they they only know what they know yeah. what they've seen, right? So, I mean, if I showed you like the first uh, renderings of Skylight, I mean, it was a straight Vietnamese like nightclub, you know what I mean? <laughs> like like lasers, yeah. all the bling bling, disco balls, and right. I was like, wait, this is not what I'm going for, you yeah. know what I mean? In my mind, because I, I was very fortunate to travel, like go to places like Bali, go to places like Coup d'État, Potato Head. Those places really inspired me to kind of like help build Skylight. Mm. So the whole thing with Skylight, when we first came here, our original intention was to do something in hospitality, but more like focus on the hotel side of things. And then when we met the owner uh, at the Havana, they had this amazing rooftop on the 43rd floor. And you know, going to like, you know, Bangkok, going to Singapore, going to even like Ho Chi Minh City, it's like there's all these iconic rooftops in all those places. Mm-hmm. And there was nothing here yet. I'm like, dude, you got the beautiful beach right in front of you and this amazing little city that's like really developing so quickly. Like, why don't we do some kind of rooftop here? So we pitched the idea, they loved it, and then it kind of just snowballed. But when we're building it out, like people didn't understand why are you doing this, why are you doing that? Because they had never experienced it. The people that were that we're bringing on board, like they'd never gone to Bali before. Mm-hmm. So like even little things were like, we're trying to build up the VIP area, right? So we have tables that are like elevated platforms. So you're like looking down on the crowd, you know what I mean? Cause if you're sitting, you're sitting down, but you still want to like feel the energy, yeah. but like you're paying a little bit more to sit here. So you want to feel like, like kind of like a stadium style, right? Yeah. So like they didn't understand why I wanted to raise these like Oh, areas up yeah and I'm, I'm, I'm just raising it by like you know two steps yeah but after i raise it two steps i could sell it for like you know a premium yeah. Alone, yeah right but those were concepts and i think the concept i was telling you guys about like holding the signs yeah you know like being in hollywood or being in vegas you know when you buy a bottle there's like a whole presentation that comes with it you know mm-hmm. and like you know it's for the attention and all yeah that there'll stuff, be right? there'll be girls with like uh fireworks or like what yeah, you call yeah, the yeah. streamers in their hands yes. and then like they're holding bottles and exactly. signs and there's a huge about the parade yeah. that comes out for someone's birthday or, mm-hmm. or just for whatever reason yeah 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 and so that's, that's yeah. something we've been doing in LA for so long yeah. so when we first came here they didn't get it so we had girls come out and they're like holding the sign and then they were just so shy and you know <laughs> Vietnamese girls or Vietnamese I think in general aren't as outgoing anyways yeah. so they're coming out and they're just like not sure why they're doing this so they're like looking down they're just like so so nervous so then I had to bring out one of my friends Sudana she came she used to work in Vegas she was working in Macau at the time and we brought her out here to train our staff so she comes out and she's like freaking pumped you know what I mean and she's like you know uh, transferring the energy we had somebody buy like a three liter bottle of champagne she like crammed on the security shoulders you know what I mean the guy's <laughs> like I don't know why this is like girls on me but you know it, it then they saw it and then we had to explain why I think the most important thing is like here you know if they've never experienced it, they don't know why you're doing it. Yeah. So it's really important for us to explain, going back to education, the importance of it and why it's different. So then when we explain to them and we showed them like, hey, when you guys are coming out with these signs, we're trying to make our guests feel special. You know, we're spelling people's names out, we're writing happy birthday, we're creating that moment that, you know, that they're gonna wanna capture or remember. Mm-hmm. So then like, uh, it was just really different in the beginning um, trying to explain this concept and yeah. then, you know there's was, there was a bunch of things you know and certain things th- that worked and didn't work you know what i mean like vietnamese people aren't used to waiting in line right. you know what i mean to go to like a club or whatever so really like, for our spot like, you have to like wait in line you know you have to buy a ticket to so, go up so what stuff. do they do out here they just go inside well most clubs there's just not a line there's no real clubs that that like have there's no lines. people that are like it's like it's packed. not like Hollywood. It's not like like in LA. Yeah. I, there's like a oh like they they'll judge you and they're like they won't even let you in. Yeah. Right. Kind of like I don't know what, what do you call that? Exclusivity. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's no exclusivity here. In in anybody in, could go in. Anybody can go as long as oh. you can pay for a table or whatever. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know of any. There's no. I've never. What if a club club gets so packed that people can't get in? That never happens. I, it rarely happens, I think. I wow. think I think I think there's times where clubs do get packed and then they make people wait and stuff like that. But it's almost on a first come first serve basis. Um, but I don't, yeah. it, it's not like how it is in Hollywood where they're like straight up just judging you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and then it's like guys can't get in unless yeah. there's a there's a girl or yes. whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so I have a country, a funny country called Jamalia. I'm a dictator to this country, <laughs> and um, we're just sick of the way society is mm. just in general. So I have this imaginary country that um, is going to be better than everywhere else. Right. Yeah. So in it, I have a school called the Jamalian Academy and it's to teach 
everyone the more practical and real life things and skills that help me become successful. So like um, no one learns how to budget their finances, like basic. The worst. They yeah. don't know anything about uh, credit cards. They don't know anything about social skills, um, how to speak with people, like mm. just all these skills that actually help you become better and successful in life. And um, I, I just want to give that out there. So, so I created this program, JamalianAcademy.com, completely free just for, you know, to give back to my fan base because it all started when – you know, I'm, I'm, it's like for 12 years, I always get fans emailing me, messaging me, saying like, hey, um, how do you how do you like start a business? How do you do this? How do you do that? How do you pursue your passion? Whatever. Right. So from the frequent like questions, I would get like the most um, requested and I would mm -hmm. create like a whole, you know, kind of like a basic one on one. So people can learn, you know, the the first steps to, to, to these things that they want to learn about. Yeah. So. um Going back to society building, right? I think this is very important because when you have an educated society, the quality of everyone's lives become better yep. because they consume smarter, they, you know, whatever. I think the old world of thinking was like, let's keep the populace dumb so mm -hmm. then we can rule them. But yeah. I think with technology and internet and all that, that's, you can't do that anymore. Mm -mm. Um, you know, the the powers and the, the 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 what do you call it like people's ability to um become more like smarter and and, and build skills and and like not be fooled yeah it's being you know um with the internet like they're they're becoming just smarter in general right it's like even evening out the playing field kind yeah of yeah so in, in and i think like a lot of you know, nations that used to try to control a lot or whatever, like like in Russia or whatever, like they can't, uh, they kind of let go. You know, mm -hmm. they're just like, okay, well, maybe it's better if, if everyone learns. And I think a lot of countries too are like, well, maybe business isn't a bad deal. Like yeah. maybe having all of our uh, people educated and working hard and, and learning and, and develop and becoming entrepreneurial is a good thing, yeah. right? So going back to Jamalian Academy and, and doing things like that, here, I think someone, if someone does it, if someone tries to educate the population in a way where their quality of life is better, they're, they're starting to innovate and create new ideas and businesses and products in Vietnam, I think it's going to skyrocket like crazy. I think it's happening already, but yeah. for the most part, from what I've seen is there still needs to be that push. There has to be somebody that's organizing this, and I know that you know, you, uh, uh, TK, you're on the board of tourism. Mm -hmm. So I, I think those are the elements that I feel that can get it there. What are you doing in terms of getting it to a point where, you know, like the Jamalian Academy is doing? Yeah, I mean, okay, so from, I, I do work with the universities and stuff like that. And what I realized is a lot of these students, they don't have, they don't like, it, just like it, how it is in the States, right? You're not getting that education. The, um, I feel like, like you said, people are, kind of being not suppressed but like just they're not being taught all these other like basic life skills or yeah whatever, right so i feel like it's the same in the states though because yeah. you have teachers who don't know mm -hmm. teaching students so it's like the blind leading the blind mm -hmm. unless you're at a top university where i'm guessing even though it's vietnam if you're at a top university here you have access to the best information yeah and the best professors yeah but it's kind of like it's more difficult than maybe a Western country or something. Like, okay, so one of the things that I realized when I came here is that people aren't as willing to share. And I thought it was weird. Like, so my staff thought it was weird because I was so open and kind of willing to like share this information that I had. Like what you're doing, you're sharing with all your fans and stuff. Yeah. And you're doing it freely, right? You don't really expect nothing. You're trying to add value to their lives and yeah. stuff, right? So I think before here, uh, people were like really scared to like tell tell other people like what they're doing because it's like, like a that. trade secret right. exactly I but what i see what i see now is that for me i always feel like my personality i always want to learn i always want to grow right so i'm always going to be trying to move up and up and up so if i teach somebody these skills they're gonna you know i'm not afraid that they're gonna get to you know the same point as me one day mm -hmm. but because then by the time they get here i should be up here because yeah. i'm constantly absolutely. learning and stuff yeah, right absolutely. so i think that's definitely a more 
Western mindset, I think, right? But um, it's exciting to see people coming back here and starting to share. Mm. You know what I mean? Like someone like Danny, like you're coming back and you're sharing with like kind of like this young filmmaker generation the skill sets that you're, you have as well. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to do the same. And I think it's important that we share to help kind of like elevate society and mm-hmm. share the knowledge that we have. Because before, I think people are always trying to like yeah. suppress and try to stay on top and da 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 da. But I think if we can all work together, we can kind of help everyone you know kind of come up yeah that being said i guess at the same time i do see the development Mm -hmm. i do see people actually uh they speak better english you Mm -hmm. know they're actually something that you said joe that was hilarious that you said you know you used to know who the fobs are yeah but now everyone dresses the same yeah Yeah. and it's only when they start speaking you're like okay Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that's a lot a lot of that is happening here where fashion is in we have all these kids looking like they're from western (laughs) Cities. Can't even tell, bro. You can't tell anymore. Uh-uh. And you have kids in America that are adopting Asian style too. Yeah. Oh, like really you right. have white now kids that looking like that. K-pop kids. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then some of them are like, "Wait, are you half Asian?" And they're like, "Nah, they're just straight weebs." <laughs> so that's wait. What you call them? Weebs, like weebos, like like yeah. That's weebs. The, yeah. I've never heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So they're like, yeah, they're we're exporting. American culture, but yeah. then there's Asian culture that's being exported too. Nice. So yeah. I think with globalism, everyone's mm-hmm. getting closer and more connected. And it's all about that. But what I do see is a lot of opportunity here because in any emerging and developing market, if anyone has the balls, the guts, and um, the courage to come in do it, there's a lot of exponential growth. And that's mm-hmm. the truth everywhere you go. You know, and in most nations, they hit that cap and, 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 you know, but the Southeast Asia is still fucking blowing up. Yeah. So this is a good place to be, guys. I, I think mean, you guys are at, a, at, the, at the forefront of culture here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, going back to what you were saying about, like, just educating and stuff. And, like, I, I know we were talking about um, so many people are learning so many things on YouTube, right? Mm-hmm. And, like, I mean, our DJs at Skylight, they literally learned how to DJ from YouTube, mm-hmm. wow. right? And it's just like, I'm like, wait, what? Where did you learn this? Like, so every time we actually do bring in some like quality DJs, like we had Miles Medina come in here and like he was, he spent like a whole um, few hours with our staff teaching them how to scratch. Mm-hmm. And it's like basic one-on-one, right? Mm-hmm. But like they were just mind blown because they don't have access to that. They see these guys on YouTube. I mean, I'm sure it's like your fans, like they get to see you on YouTube and then all of a sudden, boom, you're right in front of like, oh shit, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So it's like being able to kind of share that knowledge and I think now, it, nowadays, it's like we're in this kind of like a more open society where people have this knowledge and they're willing to share. So it's ex- I love seeing that. And I know that what you're doing, it sounds really exciting. And mm-hmm. hopefully, we can figure out ways for you to kind of like come out here and like, you know, teach yeah. some of these uh, things business, to some of the... Something like that. Nothing. And you are the first. Yeah. Our first yeah. guest on very Good Morning honored, Vietnam, dude. Yeah. I didn't even know. It's like, a test subject. But I'm very happy. I'm very happy it's going on. Uh, I'm, I'm happy for you. You know, I'm obviously your brother. I'm JK for life. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things where I did, we were talking about this podcast. We didn't know who it was going to be. Yeah. And when I knew you were going to come back, I said, this is it. So yeah. it wasn't planned. We asked. And without even a uh, pause, Joe said yes. So I'm super happy about that. Thank, Thank you very you. much, brother. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. So any any last words for some of your fans, some uh, some folks out there, and uh, what kind of advice? What, what, what is one of the models that you live by? Um, one of the models I live by is, well, this all started with JK, mm-hmm. and it was like teaching good things in a bad way. Mm. Right? Teaching good things in a bad way. So, <laughs> so like we always... I mean, we might cuss and, and, and say things unfiltered yeah. and, and pretty much expose a lot about ourselves. Mm-hmm. But um, what that does is it helps me connect with people because I always said, like, who would you rather listen from? Like an ex-con telling you don't do drugs or like a person that's squeaky clean and he's never done anything wrong mm, in yeah. his life. Yeah. Right. So first it's it's about that experience and sharing that and then another thing is i realized that i'm really passionate about um helping people evolve mentally Mm. and so that's why i'm so yeah like i'm so into like giving out free information because i think a part of me is like i wish someone told me this stuff too yes and if i learned it sooner i would have felt more freer because i i went through a lot of hardships 
with my own um, stubbornness and my lack of understanding how to solve a problem and navigate mm-hmm. through life yeah. that maybe I can help speed up the process by giving this information out there to as many human beings as possible. Yeah. Because, you know, like all three of us are kind of killing it. Like we're living in a, in a, in a, in a privileged kind of situation yeah. where we can do what we want. And we were just talking about how freeing that is. Yeah. It's so freeing when you have an idea or a dream and then you just follow through and you make it work. Mm-hmm. It's very fulfilling. It's very like you 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 know you have a purpose and you're giving and and you're you're creating happiness in the lives of others, mm-hmm. and that kind of work not a lot of people get to do. Yeah. So uh, and it, and it's all about the balance, right? Having that, having a great social life, having a good love life, having all kinds of people yep. you know to share this energy with. Yeah. And a lot of people can't achieve this. So for me, I'm like, well my life's passion is to get as many people as possible to achieve that yeah mm, yeah love that, dude. we're still here so yeah. let's let's do our best and uh follow in joe's words and uh <laughs> hopefully uh we can have a, another amazing podcast like this maybe you'll return one day yeah and follow then we'll one do, day soon yeah one day soon all right and that's it that's and it. uh i guess uh thank you very much cheers and uh this thank is you. Thank good you. morning on.